success still needs to come from you and yeah you know you has the actual kind of end user needs to build those workflows and processes and then tools are just helping you get from a to b faster it's it's not a shortcut it is a it is a tool yeah. you know you, you have to use it like you like the drones a tool yeah you know the software is a tool as well mm. as is the software you used you know to process it in the, at the the end result Hello. Hello, Alex. How are you doing? I'm good. Good. We'll be stripey top on. Stripey top just yeah. There we stripey go. Stripey top. Yeah. I've got I've got yeah. hammer colours on, similar to hammer colours. Yeah, I kind of I feel if there was a green screen behind me, I'd disappear. <laughs> Most probably. Yeah. Ah, oh, so here we are. This is week six. Yes, it is six. week six. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Six weeks of podcasting. Mm. I think we're doing all right. There's plenty of subjects we've been talking about yeah plenty of people interested plenty of views quite a few downloads of the actual podcast available on all good part podcast directories yeah i think we should open it up to the audience for the next topic so if i think people listening if they want to if they want us to cover the next topic they can suggest it in the comments or that's a really good idea Mm. i like that Uh, and we also discussed at the end of uh, last week when we'd stopped recording that i think we may start introducing guests that's a good idea. So yeah. We can mm-hmm. get some some guests in. Mm-hmm. Maybe one of our devs would like to come and join us. Yeah. Yeah. We um, can have the engineers come in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For a chat, as long as they keep their potty mouths to themselves. <laughs> Not they really got potty mouths. Yeah. Um, um, you know, we, we may get some um get some get some guesties in. Yeah. Um from our from our partners or 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 whoever, really. Yeah. If there's anyone listening wants to be on the pod, just let us know. Uh, yeah, we'll that'd be, be good. Yeah. yeah, get some surprise guests. Yeah yeah let's do that let's do that so yeah if there's anyone out there that that wants to um wants to join us uh on a on a podcast or you've got any suggestions about what you want us to talk about um you can drop us an email uh team at hammermissions.com and um yeah we'll take anything into consideration as long as it's drone and tech related of course yeah. with drones talking. data photogrammetry yeah, yeah. we don't um, want to be talking about cars or hollywood yeah yeah not not as the main subject at least not as a main subject i'm I'm quite happy to talk about hollywood and cars because i like <laughs> both uh but drones drones is uh is where we are so this week we mm-hmm. should be talking about how to improve the quality of your 2d maps and 3d models that's it so that's an interesting topic for those that have already been creating their maps or models already uh and are now looking to optimize the quality of these models yep so it's not just about creating a model but how do you create you know the best model possible or the best map possible um and especially if you're doing repeat stuff so if you're doing repeat maps or repeat inspections how do you progressively improve the quality of the map or the model as you go go on so i think that would be interesting to discuss um where, where should we start alex what do you think we should start with as mm-hmm. it says on my list up here okay lighting and exposure settings Okay. Mm-hmm. So um, obviously very important, mm-hmm. uh, not only in things like photogrammetry and mapping, um, lighting and exposure settings in any form of photography or filming is obviously very important. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, overexposed images are no good. Underexposed images are no good. Mm-hmm. Um, same with, you know, same with uh, lighting and brightness. Yeah. Um, so yeah so kind of you know where do you start where do mm-hmm. you start so we've always said um that auto exposure settings are not always the best way to shoot your end product your you know your your photogrammetry or your or your mapping yeah um so a good suggestion would be so by all means use auto mm-hmm. but use auto to the point where you can go up and find your light settings, your your exposure settings and your light lighting settings. Mm-hmm. And then once you're there and you're happy with what auto exposure is giving you, mm-hmm. then set that manual. Right. Set yeah. that on manual. Yeah. So when you fly the rest of your mission, you know, if the light changes with auto exposure, your pictures are going to change. They're going to yeah. go from light to dark. They're going to look horrendous. Trying to splice those images together is going to cause problems with the with the software. Mm. So you know, set your set your exposure to a a defined point or a defined level that mm. you're happy with, 
and stick with it. Yeah. Yeah, because the challenge is that whilst you're flying, especially if it's a day with constantly changing, you know, mm. weather patterns or conditions or, you know, you basically you could suddenly have, you know, suddenly you could have cloud cover uh, and yep. sun emerging from the cloud cover cover and now some areas of your site or your asset are much more well lit as opposed to others and then if you have automatic exposure it will try and correct for that which means that some of the images will end up looking a lot darker than others and other right. some images will start looking a lot more exposed than others and you sort of end up with this mishmash of images at the end which if you think about what 2d maps and 3d models are they're essentially outputs of photogrammetry software yes and photogrammetry is not able to identify features in two different images if they don't have the same if the pixels that represent those features don't have the same exposure yeah i mean if the quality if the quality varies throughout your your um your captured imagery then the software is going to struggle to sort of geolocate or represent you know put that soft put that those pictures back together i put my teeth in sooner or later in this this thing (laughs) (laughs) just to just to explain to our listeners and viewers i haven't been very well over the last couple of days so i'm a bit i'm a bit today oh we'll get there we'll get there it'll be fine don't worry Mm. so yeah lighting exposure settings very very important uh to produce your your high quality end result yeah and the other thing to be said here is that a lot of people should try to get this right on the field itself Yes, I, I think that there is quite a lot of people who want to basically collect whatever data in the field and then try and fix the data in the yeah. post, which it doesn't really work because, you know, it's a beautiful idea that collect whatever you want and then fix it in the post. But post-processing, when it, it firstly adds a lot of time. Secondly, you don't really know if you'll be able to do it or not. And third, you don't know what the end result will be um, because it might look fine to a human the images they look near exposure but to a machine or or a software program trying to analyze yeah. these images the differences are still very visible even if they are invisible to the human eye well, we had this issue last week didn't we when i went out and did a shoot mm. and unfortunately the camera had been preset onto shutter priority mm. uh, which i didn't know so i went up and took all these glorious shots yay look at it got back and realized actually they're all useless yeah. because shutter priority had under expo- yeah that it underexposed every single shot no. so the shots were really dark and almost menacing it mm. was a, the mill which is quite menacing anyway which we do tend to talk about quite a lot um so you know inevitably i had to go back out and, and reshoot so it's very important that you check your exposure and lighting settings you make sure they're correct um and it was all right for us because you know for me the mill's a 20 minute drive so I can just go down and redo it. But if you're on a you're on a job, you know, and you've got to travel a long way for it, you get there, you shoot all these amazing pictures, you get back and you realize your exposure settings are wrong and your lighting's wrong. What are you gonna do? You're gonna go back and do it all over again at your cost? Yeah. That's just you know. not that's just, you know, when the cost of the operation sometimes is the travel to the site, you just mm-hmm. can't afford to do that. So no. Um, so do it right the first time, get get the exposure right on the field. You know, that's basically, if you want to be a professional, I think that's one of the things to really look at. I think that's kind of, um, yeah, I think no amount of software can fix bad no. data. Yeah, so, no, maybe um, at some time in the future, but definitely not now. Yeah, maybe in the future. Um, I think but there's going to be probably more it, future. Even then, you know, you'd kind of want to do it yourself, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, this is one of the things that, I think that one of the things that people get wrong is that they start thinking that tools can do everything. And, you know, like, so, you know, even our software, it, it does things, but it's, it's a, it's a aid. It's a help for you yeah. to be able to do things quickly, more efficiently, uh, faster, better, cheaper, but essentially the process still needs to come from you. And, yeah. you know, you has the actual kind of end user needs to build those workflows and processes. And then tools are just helping you get, from a to b faster it's it's not a shortcut it is a it is a tool yeah. you know you, you have to use it like you like the drone's a tool yeah you know the software is a tool as well mm. as is the software you used you know to process it in the, at the the end result yeah um as is the camera 
as is the camera, as is all of it, really. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, the controller, the camera, your hands, the whole shooting match. Yeah. Um, you know, Which, yeah. at the end of the day, it's it's how you perceive it. And, you know, if you, you've got to make sure those settings are correct. Nothing yeah. beats the old visual eye. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. And that brings me to the other point about the camera as being a tool as well, which should be used correctly and not sort of abused in the sense that, mm. you know, there's a lot of, I think with photogrammetry, one of the challenges is that if you do not have um, fixed focal lenses, um, it can be sometimes hard for the software to to uh, cross correlate um, between images. Yeah. So, so if you have cameras, which are essentially, again, tools in your workflow with different focal lenses, um, you know, they, they or different zoom levels, perhaps, or, you know, all that can fundamentally make it harder for the software to yeah i mean we, you know we have had people ask you know what if i shot you know do this from from a drone and then do you know take some ground shots with a camera so we can also talk about nadir and oblique or nadir versus oblique or nadir and oblique together yeah absolutely so all depends on what you're trying to do if you're trying to do a 2d map um then Nadir, which is just the top-down imagery, um, yep. is sufficient to get high-quality data. If you're trying to do a 3D model um, and it's potentially a vertical structure, something with a height to it, um, then you need to get oblique imagery. And oblique imagery is basically not top-down, but angled imagery with a drone looking at an angle at the asset. Um, yep. And it all makes sense, right? I mean, if if... If I showed you a couple of images um, of something, but just the top down of those images and and kind of never showed you the sides of those things or sort of like the, you know, how the facades of something looks, if it's a building, you you wouldn't be able to. Well, I guess as a human, we have more contextual knowledge, but it's you don't have the fundamental information to be able no. to model it in 3D. I mean, you've never seen the facade of a building. You've only seen the top down of a building. If you only saw the roof of a building, and you're asked to reconstruct it in 3D. Even as a human, it's it's a near impossible task. Yeah, well, you just don't get the the um, the, the concept of of how it looks mm. as a 3D shape. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of um, yeah, I mean, Google Maps is a great example. Mm -hmm. um, some places, London, Brighton, you know, large cities and built up areas, they have done in 3D. Mm -hmm. But if you come out to kind of my way, for example, in the middle of nowhere in East Sussex, everything's flat. You've mm -hmm. got no, you've got no, um, no context of of how tall something is. Mm -hmm. So that's where oblique comes in. Yeah, East Sussex, by the way, for viewers that are not in the UK, yes, is uh, southeast. <laughs> southeast it's the UK. England. Yeah, it's down here. Yeah, in the southeast the, of England. Yeah, south coast, south yeah. coast of the UK south, yeah. is uh, is where I am from where i currently reside there we go yes uh, so yeah you were saying that there are areas which don't have 3d models um yeah. on google earth and you know it's it, you can't really even as a human understand so i think it really boils down to giving the software those oblique images that it can use to create a 3d representation um yes a 3d model and high quality means that that they should also exist with the top down that is the nadir photos and one of the really important things there is to make sure that the nadir and oblique imageries overlap because it's not it's not sufficient that essentially they you have those imagery you need them to overlap because again you want the software to be able to identify these features and understand their 3d positioning and if they don't overlap it's very hard for the software to figure that out yeah, it needs to be able to recognize that that's the top and that's the side. Yeah. And that that overlap gives the gives the software that um intelligence, I guess if you if you call it that, mm -hmm. to know where the top ends and the sides start and how mm -hmm. to how to mash those two together to make the full 3D 3D yeah. imagery. Yeah. It's um I guess another way to explain this is that if you think of a chimney on top of a on top of a building and that yep. chimney has been, it, it can be seen in a top-down photo and yep. then also can be seen in a oblique photo. Um, the more photos you have of that chimney, whether it's top-down or oblique, the more data points 
the software can use to estimate the 3D position of that chimney. Yep. Um, and um, and more accurately as well. So, um, yeah. So if you don't want your buildings to look blobby or your 3D models not to look blobby, blobby, then best Ob to get both. Yeah, obliques is 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 definitely where it's at. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we've done we've done plenty of tests with with Hammer, um, <laughs> mainly on the mill, the infamous mill, the which mill. we must we must put up on our video podcast at some point. Mm -hmm. You know, so the you know viewers can see actually what we're harping on about half the time. Um, you know, the mill is our our test ground, and we you know we continue to test there to you know to try and get the best three D imagery we we possibly can. So there's there's more tests hopefully that we'll be doing this week um which we will which we will share in some time in the future exactly yeah yeah and with the mill one of the crucial learnings um recently has been that um well what can we say about the geometry of the mill alex uh it's an l shape it is an l shape that and, it is and it's better if you capture an l shaped building with an l shaped polygon that's um, right as opposed to something else um I mean, originally we were just drawing a, a large rectangle over the top of the area and mm. capturing way more than we actually needed to, yeah. which means when you're capturing the obliques, the obliques would also have to capture those parts for the for the software to be able to figure out where the sides of the building are. Yeah. So we've kind of gone back to the drawing board and decided, actually, let's capture the the object, the, the shape of the building, which yeah. is an L shape. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've tested it already and the results were pretty good. Mm -hmm. And now what we're going to do is go back and we're actually going to expand that L shape. So we'll still keep it an L and mm -hmm. um, which is what the shape of the mill is, but this time we're going to expand it. So it covers, it also covers over the edges. Yeah. So when we've got our top down shot over the top of those edges, it captures those edges. So when we take our oblique shots, Mm -hmm. The oblique shots can mash up with the top-down shots. This is very confusing, but we kind of know what we're talking about. <laughs> so the oblique shots can match up with the uh, with the top-down shots of the side of the building. Yeah, Does that makes sense. Yeah. So essentially, what you're talking about is alignment, right? So if you when you yes. upload images to Hammer Hub, uh, which is a software we've been talking about all this time, so instead of calling it software, let's just call it Hammer Hub from now on, so that yeah, people know what we're we talking are Hammer. about. That's what so, we do. So um, Hammer Hub, where you upload your images. <laughs> Um, basically, um, for the software or Hammer Hub to know how to align the images, the the important thing is to essentially create enough overlap between all different points of view. Um, and I think we I've made a separate video on photogrammetry and all of how it works, and it explains yep. features in photogrammetry and how features are found, and then how images are sort of paired together. Yeah. Um, and what you want to minimize is conflicts where some of the images don't agree where the object really is in 3D space. So overlap and nadir oblique imagery helps with all of that. Um, and following the shape of the object also helps with that because it minimizes those conflicts that you could have um, in trying to create a 3D model from 2D images. Um, yes, um, well, well said. That took, that took what I kind of blurted out mm -hmm. and put it into a nice little... Nice little package. Well done. Oh, good, thank you. Good work. Well, that's what you, oh, that's what, kind of what we do. <laughs> that's what we do. I, 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 waffled and, I waffled and you kind of went, this is how it works. Bosh, done. Yeah. Um, so, you know. What a, but what about capturing water? Water is bad news. <laughs> water is bad news. Water <laughs> equals trouble. Water does <laughs> equal trouble. It's featureless. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, uh, unless you're shooting, you know, unless you, you, you know, you're over a part of water with loads of boats on it. Happy days. But mm. you know, if you're if you're capturing water by itself, it has no features. The software will not be able to define one bit of water to the next. Yeah. Um maybe slightly different if you're capturing water within an area that has structure. Mm -hmm. Um, so for example, I don't know, a you know, a beach front or mm -hmm. something like that. But if you're capturing water on its own, wouldn't bother yeah Fe featureless yeah and again it boils down down to i think a lot of people think or call 2d maps and 3d models stitching and i think yes. the word stitching is a misnomer because 
realistically, the images are not being stitched in the conventional way. Like, you you know, the software or Hammer Hub doesn't basically take two images and put them right next to each other just because the GPS locations were right next to each other. So it's more finding actual features in those images and putting them together based on those features. But if you capture water, which typically doesn't have any features, so it can't find anything and they can't put them together. So, um, you know, it's a bit, you know, it's the same as humans. Like, right, if you if you showed a human, like five patches of water that look exactly the same and ask them, can you put uh, them yeah. together? Like, I mean... <laughs> put put those put bits them. of water together. It's featureless. They all look the same. Yeah, They all look the same. So, yeah, I mean, it's the, you know, I guess you could have the same issue with uh, if you had a, a large flat structure um, with plenty of pools of water on the roof, so a flat roof. Mm -hmm. um, and I have seen them in the past when I've been surveying, et cetera, where you do get large buildings, flat area, huge ingress of water. Mm. That's also going to cause problems. Yeah. Because yeah. if that, you know, if that ingress of water is massive and you've taken, you know, you've taken shots that are quite close and it's going to try, it's going to try and put those images together of those bodies of water, it's going to cause the software some problems Yeah, because again, water is featureless. Yes. <laughs> um, and then the other thing that I think can trip up a lot of people is that sometimes things are full of features, but then they still look the same. So yeah, um, I think the classic example of this is windows on a building. Um, so if you were to take a few photos of, you know, houses that have exactly the same windows or like even one building with many different, many similar looking windows, yeah. Um, it can again be a bit challenging uh, for the software to know, well, this window actually goes here um, and that window goes there because they all look the same. So, you know, in theory, from the software's point of view, it's trying to solve this puzzle. Just think of it like a puzzle, like a jigsaw, yep. right? Oh, I could fit this here. Um, and then the windows don't actually work, even though they I have. Features. I assume it's the same for um, tower blocks, for example, like mm. somewhere like the shard, mm. you know, trying to 3D render the shard. Yeah. A lot of those windows look the same. The glass, is a, glass is a huge problem as well, yeah. like reflections. It's um, reflective, same as water. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it does cause software grief. Yeah. So to handle these scenarios, um, so windows or something like glass or some of those things, it's easier because what you can do, if you think that the if you're capturing the subject from close enough and from that point of view or that distance to the structure, everything looks the same, then just move move a bit further out and yep. you'll you'll capture more of the scene and that will capture more features in the scene um so more often than not giving, yeah giving the software a better opportunity to to figure out yeah what goes where yeah yes uh, um and you could also if you wanted you could capture um <clears throat> at different uh distances um so you could capture a, a higher altitude flight and then a lower altitude flight. Uh, and then one of them, if it's a particularly hard subject, then the higher altitude flight is providing those differentiating features. And then yep. the lower altitude flight is providing details for GSD and, and whatnot. So you could do that. Um, combo it up. Combo it up, yeah. Combo um, it up. It is a very creative task, I mean, to be honest. It like, is. You know, a lot of people think photogrammetry is just, you know, take images and press a button. But in fact, when you get into it... Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're right with the with the height. You know, take shots from high, shots from low. You know, blend those blend those pictures together. You know, it it works. It does work. We've seen yeah. it work. Yeah, yeah, countless times. Yeah, yeah. You get. I, mean, I guess that kind of leads onto sort of the the overlap side of things. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the <laughs> overlap is very very important um, for photogrammetry. As it is for mapping, um, you know, photogrammetry, especially, um, you know, we, we'd recommend an overlap of anywhere between sort of 70 and 80%. Yeah. Yeah. So every, every two images, um, side to side, front to back, uh, should have 70% or more overlap, um, by overlap. Well, it's just traditional overlap, two images overlapping. So that 80% yep. of one image is, uh, reoccurring in the other image, um, yeah, I can't believe I've just defined overlap. I just I never thought I had to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you've just told you've just told our viewers and our listeners exactly what overlap is. Um, 
But uh, again, it's it's important because the features need to be identified across images, and by having higher overlap, you're increasing the the probability of finding the same feature um, across different images, um, and helping Hammer Hub to figure out where to put those photos. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, overlap is quite well known. I think a lot of people know about this. Um, what about the drone and keeping the drone moving, the pictures, sort of taking the pictures? So, you know, do you think it's better if the if we fly the drone, take images as it's moving, or should we position the drone in one place and take, um, you know, rotate the gimbal and take images? Because a lot of people ask whether that's a reasonable tactic. I mean, uh, to be honest, the way the way we do things at Hammer is the the drone moves. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you whether you fly and shoot mm -hmm. or whether you fly stop and shoot. Mm -hmm. is entirely up to you and it depends how high quality imagery you want mm -hmm. um you know it also depends on how fast the drone's going mm -hmm. you know if the, the drone's going one meter a second for example mm -hmm. then you can afford to have the drone keep moving as opposed to stop and shoot because otherwise it's just going to take forever to capture your your imagery mm -hmm. um but as we discovered on you know doing a facade shoot you know, if the if the camera if the if the drone's moving and it's moving too fast and it takes the photo, then you are going to get some blur, which again, you know, the software, hammer hammer software, um, isn't going to be able to define those those points. It's 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 gonna have difficulty in picking up recognizable points to uh, to attach to its other overlapped images. Yeah. So in so... my recommendation, mm -hmm. um, I would go for moving stop and shoot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think there's so many parameters here. It's very hard to provide um, an absolute, Sorry. you know, use this every single time. But yeah, more often than not, if you want crystal clear images, um, then stop and take the photo and you would capture all the details. Yeah. Um, if you want to keep moving, then um, because obviously some jobs are really large and you can't stop and take photos because it'll take forever to get everything captured. Yeah. Um, for those jobs, um, yes, use something like the mapping mode where you're flying and taking images all the time. Um, I think the important thing there is to, as you mentioned correctly, to reduce motion blur and you can reduce it like to the point where it doesn't matter. It's negligible uh, yeah. from the perspective of um, Hammer Hub. So essentially for, for that, what you need to do is you need to calculate what, what is your expected motion blur? Yeah. Um, and we've actually made a whole video on motion blur and how to calculate it. But it's essentially the amount of time your camera is open uh, across um, two images. Uh, so you, if you multiply those two things together, you can get your essentially motion blur. And then if your motion blur is less than one times your GSD uh, or le definitely less than 1.5 times your GSD, then you will get good results. Um, we have a completely separate video on that. So we'll link, we do. It. We'll link it on here so that yep. you can go have a watch. Um, but yeah, keeping the drone moving for large jobs, good idea. Stopping it for small jobs, good idea. Um, the other thing that shouldn't be done or should be avoided at all costs is to take multiple pano photos stopping in one place. Yeah, panos are, panos are not good. I mean, they're, they're great if you want to create a, a vertical pano or, yeah. a, or a horizontal pano mm -hmm. or a mega pano, which mm -hmm. is the other thing mm -hmm. we've spoken about in the past. But when you're collecting data for mapping or, or 3D modeling, mm -hmm. you know, stop, stop, and, stop and shoot multiple gimbal shots all in one go is not recommended yeah and the reason for that is because a lot of the time photogrammetry works with a crucial step called structure from motion yep um as the name implies you're trying to approximate the structure from motion and if there is no motion um then you can't really approximate the structure that well so it's similar to i guess the best way to explain this is um if the drone our eyes are able to estimate depth yep. because they have focal lenses embedded in them. And there's a fixed distance between those, you know, the, the two cameras <laughs> in our heads. And we can, we can understand or triangulate a point because each one of those, so if you close one of your eyes and you close the other eye, you always see that this sort of like, you know, the image images are actually a bit shifted. Yeah. Yeah. That's, 
they're at different two different angles yeah but we have a fixed distance between the eyes and our brain does the processing to understand what the yeah. what, what depth feels like and so we can reach out and understand how close or far far we are so it's a similar process where the drone is essentially representing at different points the distance between those eyes and then tr and then the brain or uh, processing software is basically figuring out where that what the, what the depth is um uh, for, for yeah. the so um that's why panos or kind of staying in one place is a bit like well you know closing one eye and then trying to look at every all parts of the trying scene. to get you trying to get your depth of field with one yeah. eye yeah yeah so um yeah, so basically Nicely described nicely yeah. described yeah. all these all these are just approximation i'm sure the people who are into photogrammetry they're listening are they like these are just approximations <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this this is rubbish what's he talking all, about what kind of analogies are these um, but uh, <laughs> uh so sometimes you have to reason by uh by analogy and kind of explain things that way so um hopefully yeah. it's clear um um but basically keep moving as you're capturing the data and that yeah that helps yeah it does um, it does plus the fact you don't want to be there forever yeah <laughs> that's true you know, I guess that yeah. kind of boils down to that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And okay. And what about the amount of data? How much data should you collect on a on a high quality job? I mean, it obviously depends on how big the job is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and sometimes too much data is is too much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people out there that will shoot manual may end up with because they don't know their overlaps or they can only guesstimate their overlaps, mm -hmm. they might end up with way more data than they actually need. Mm. Um, so it's hard to define how much data because it all depends on what job you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, also depends on what camera you're using. Yeah. Because, you know, you might be using a Mavic 2 Pro yeah. or a Mavic 3, you know, mm -hmm. that, that has a 20 megapixel camera mm -hmm. uh a, a fixed focal mm -hmm. or you might be using for example a p1 or a phase one mm -hmm. you know and those higher megapixel cameras yeah will collect more data they will have yeah. more more information per shot and yeah. obviously the file size will be bigger so it's, it's hard yeah. to define um how much data to collect yeah but too too much data is often you know it's it's overkill yeah or even too uh less data or too little issue. data yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. too little you data know. you can't you can't really create data in the post but you can get rid of data in the post yeah um yeah it's very hard i think there are a couple of rules of thumb here maybe maybe there's you know you need to make sure you cover the entire site or asset you're trying to capture yep so you know definitely enough data to be able to cover everything is important um enough data to have right overlaps is important yep um enough data to get both the top bar like the um nadir and the oblique images as we discussed is important yep. um and then hitting the right gsd is important as well so depending on how close or far you need to be from the structure and as you mentioned correctly with the camera sensor you're using all of those factors play into um, how much data you're going to collect um so yeah there is a trade-off here too little data means you will not have a great 2d map or 3d model because you yep. missed to capture some areas you miss bits miss bits uh, or too much data would mean that you are now spending a lot of time moving that data around uploading it and it's taking time to process and you can't actually share it easily with your end customer or so, you have or you have to spend time trimming the fat and getting rid of the stuff that you you don't need yeah so there there is a fine line yeah. um it's figuring out where that fine line is dependent on what job you're doing yeah and that's basically, you know, again, part of being a professional, uh, you know, to be able to estimate how yeah. much data do you need for this job. And I think the more jobs you do, whether you're an in-house team, you're basically, you know, doing these jobs uh, more for your own assets, for your own uh, inspections or um, for your own modeling, um, you get accustomed to knowing what a typical site or structure, how much data is captured. Yeah. Uh, for, yeah. You know, so the more you do it, the more kind of intuitively you know how much data it would it would involve i mean the mill i know every time roughly how much data i'm gonna get yeah exactly because um, i've been there so many times <laughs> <laughs> that's a little in-house project yeah. yes so, yeah uh, we love we love the mill yeah <laughs> 
brilliant. You've um, not been to the mill yet, have you? You see, I've not been to the mill, you, but because you live in London, you live it. in London. You have because <laughs> <laughs> you live in London. I live down here in East Sussex. I'm going to have to get you down to see the mill. Yes, I mean I it's it, it's not very interesting once you're there, but you need to come and witness I, it. For I need to, I need to be there. Yeah, I think in the early days of Hammer, I was on top of quite a few roofs, like supermarket roofs <laughs> and and uh, kind of warehouse roofs, um, seeing a lot of these roof inspections done um and also being part of like non-drone like other types of service which was really interesting um yeah other types of roof service um but yeah i'm very excited to see the mill um to see it in reality i've seen it in in, in i've seen it as a 3d model so many times <laughs> that, and probably a couple of photos that i've taken with me in it or the drone yeah. in it but yeah you'll have to you have to come down and uh come down and have a look we um, we, we need to do that yes yeah uh, that will be our Maybe the next one. We maybe we take the entire team for a day out. Ooh, a day out. A day out to Roberts Bridge. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, I'm sure. I'm sure they'll love it. I mean, it is. You know, it is literally in the in the middle of nowhere. Um, nice little village. Yeah, could be a, a countryside. Lovely, you know, offside. Got lovely. Thing. Got a lovely curry house. Oh, there we Roberts go. Bridge. Best. Mm. I, I would say yeah. it's the best one in East Sussex. Well, there we go. We've got a next team lunch sorted. There you go. All sorted. Cool. So there you go. I guess mm -hmm. that's, that's you know, in a nutshell, albeit quite a long nutshell, quite a big nutshell, <laughs> uh, how to improve the quality of your 2D and 3D models. Yeah. Your 2D maps and 3D models. Yeah. So a quick rundown. Let's do a quick rundown. So yep. um, make sure your lighting is great. Yep. Uh, good exposure settings. Uh, make sure you're using fixed uh, focal length uh, camera so you're not mixing cameras with VR they are of the same spec as much as possible um, make sure you're capturing nadir and oblique imagery um, and they overlap uh, yep. make sure you are following the object's geometry so if it's a tower you are capturing it like a tower if it's an l-shaped building you're capturing like an l-shaped building uh, avoid anything that is featureless like water um, or any kind of patterns and if you see patterns um, try to move away to get more distinct images in your data set um use high overlap so 70 percent or more yep um keep the drone moving so don't take images from the same spot in the air try to collect the right amount of data uh, which is hard to estimate but something that you will get better over time with and try to avoid motion blur and fly at the correct speed so those are kind of and breathe and Cause breathe because you, <laughs> <all, laughs> you said all of that without taking yeah. a breath there we um go. yeah yeah so i mean all of that information mm -hmm. is available in in our resources on our website mm -hmm. we've got lots of detailed info on on all of those subjects mm -hmm. which you can go and have a look at yeah. www.hammermissions.com yeah is where you'll find it under learning i do believe yeah it's uh hammer, hammermissions.com slash learn so yeah and we share everything that we find we don't like to keep things um you know in silos i think if we learn something about how you can make 2d maps and 3d models better then we like to share that with everybody because i think as an industry we only improve when we share things in terms of yeah how to do it's an, better workflows it's an advantage to everyone yeah not just us we won't keep it a secret exactly it's not our secret to keep nope so there you go cool another yeah. week done although we had a bit of a blip in the middle with the yeah like technical wobble yeah. um but yeah we um yeah so there you go that sums it up really yeah so that does sum it up yeah so if you're if you're curious to um figure out how to improve the quality of your existing models and you want to have a chat with us you can email us at team at hammermissions.com uh, we're happy to review maybe some of your past projects as well and provide any tips or any kind of advice on how you can improve the models. Um, obviously, we provide flight planning and 3D data processing uh, for sites uh, and assets. So if you're looking to capture something um, using our software, then we're also quite happy to sort of help you walk, walk you through it, essentially. Yeah. So. so if you like our video, that's what I say at the end of all of these. Yeah. It's like I just blurb this off. Mm -hmm. Like our video, give us a like. Mm -hmm. You can also subscribe to us. If you want to chat to us, as Farron has just said, give us a shout on team at hammermissions.com. And that is another week done for our Hammer Missions podcast. Cheers, Baron. Cheers, Alex. See you next week. Yeah, see you next week. <laughs> Cheers, <Take> bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. Bye.